When we talk about Homeland Security, we talk about it as an enterprise. This is the way that the Department of Homeland Security has now framed it. They want to remind people that this is not a governmental function alone. Now certainly you have a governmental function and the governmental function is led by the federal government, which if, if you will, will provide for the framework that the rest of these uh, entities should be hanging the meat on, if you will. But anyone here who has any uh, background in government knows that the implementation of the strategies that uh, populate that framework is usually done at state and local government. That's where the rubber meets the road. So, for instance, our, our, our students here, especially the active component guys, love them, uh, they come here with the idea that, okay, the military is, you know, the, we, we realize that the military is a part of things, but it's, it's the, the central part of things. And then over time, we drag them kicking and screaming from their comfort zone into reali a realization that this is a whole of government experience that we're talking about here in running the country. Uh, and there is the, the interagency. And they arrive at this, this moment, this, uh, this awakening, and then we pat them on the head and say, now let me tell you about the other 87,000 jurisdictions which populate this United States, under 54 different sovereigns out there who do not live at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue that call themselves governors. And oh, by the way, when you've seen one state, you've seen one state, which part makes part of the problems uh, the, in, our, in our working with one another from time to time. But anyway, the governmental issue is a, certainly a big component of it. But another big component of the Homeland Security enterprise is the private sector. You know, we talk about critical infrastructure in the United States. Infrastructure, uh, the, the systems and the components of systems which are so vital to our people that the incapacitation or destruction of those systems will lead to what we call clinically a debilitating impact on society, on the econ on economy, on public health and safety, on national morale. All of those wonderful things which make our country go, right? So you think, man, this critical infrastructure, if it's that important, then the government must have this baby by the sack and swivel, right? They must be in control of it. And you would be wrong. Because I will tell you that conservatively, 85% of the critical infrastructure in the United States is owned by the private sector. Now, is the private sector therefore responsible for its security? Well, yes and no. To what degree? I mean, we ex expect a certain uh, amount of daily security that's being provided by the private sector uh, against, uh, if you will, an ascending element of threat. But do we expect the private sector to, for instance, guard our power grid against a deliberate assault by uh, a transnational threat? And the answer to that is, well, of course not, not alone. But should they be involved in the discussion as far as putting the strategies together? Well, yeah, probably so. So that's why we have 16 different sectors of, of critical infrastructure, everything ranging from chemical to uh, power, the energy sector to water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those sectors are, if you will, guided by organizations that bring the, gov the government and those private sector people together to discuss how we should best approach these problems. So that's kind of enlightening for some people, but it goes beyond that. In addition to the private sector, we have non-governmental organizations. There are a few people in the room, thank you very much for being here, that uh, look like you could have been born around the same time as me, certainly not you, madam. But <laughs> we remember that when we were talking about essential functions, like mass casualty, do you know what the entity was that was, by the government's design, in charge of mass casualties in, in the United States up until about 20 years ago? By design, by charter? The American Red Cross. Okay? And there are other non-governmental organizations just like that one that, once again, we have to tie into our thinking about this because this is not a governmental problem. This is a societal function. Right? And then let's take it to the next step. So far, we've talked about everything within the territorial confines of the United States, our society, our people. But there may come a time, ladies and gentlemen, where we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we're going to require all the help that we can get within the United States and still need more. And at that point, we should be looking to international partners. We are a benevolent people. I make no apologies um, about the United States and how we have responded to the needs of other countries in times of crises. But what we're not really good at yet, we're starting to get better at, is receiving aid from other countries if necessity were to dictate. Now, fortunately, in your and my times, even looking against Katrina, even looking at some other activities, uh, like in this, this past fall, all this, uh, these major disasters, we were still able to meet the requirements 
that we have to meet. But we will be talking about some things during the course of our discussion here together, which will exceed the capabilities, which will be genuinely catastrophic in their character. And ladies and gentlemen, when that time comes, we better be prepared to receive help from other folks because we're going to need it. But beyond all that, I would suggest you we need to look once again back in really within ourselves to another group, an important group, communities, faith-based organizations, part of that homeland security enterprise. I will tell you until about the middle of the last century, emergency management was a matter of community. And basically, if it wasn't being done in the community, it was not being done, period, all right? The last catastrophe the United States probably really experienced was in the 1930s. Those of you from the Midwest may remember reading about it, but it was the Great Dust Bowl Crisis, when 770,000 people were displaced by, from their homes by natural disaster. And the government basically did nothing. People forget that Katrina was the second time in the 20th century where New Orleans was nearly wiped out, led to this great migration north of much of the New Orleans population, and at that time, the government itself basically did nothing. This idea of the government having to come to the rescue in all situations uh, is a relatively new phenomenon for our people and in our thinking. And I would suggest to you that we need to re-cage re our thinking in that regard. Now, I will stop here for a moment to remind everyone, as I do when I talk to people overseas, that we would probably be, be misled if we were to start thinking of this in terms of some sort of monolithic American mindset towards things, because that does not exist. The way people responded in New Orleans during Katrina and the way people responded in Iowa during the great floods of 2005, which you all remember, right? Yes. Well, not all of you really do. Why? Because they took care of it. It didn't hit the headlines because they responded to it. And that's the way it is in many areas of the country. I would suggest to you that we need to return to that kind of mindset where we depend upon one another first and, first and foremost. We talk an awful lot about first responders. Your best first responder may be your next door neighbor. Okay? So this enterprise becomes very, very important. And those communities are no, no stronger than the families which occupy those communities. Which leads me to this thing that I refer to as the block of resiliency. We have a nation, a great society, but that society is built upon our communities. And those communities are built upon our families. And the families are dependent upon the individuals. And I will tell you that the social structure will collapse upon itself if we do not remember that that's the way things are. Okay? So I'm supposed to be talking about the government and the army and stuff like that. Why do I do that with you? Because you're citizens. Okay? And I remind my students all the time that you are not only citizens, but you're citizens that people look to in terms of leadership. But when we get back to the governmental function, how do we want to approach these things? Well, a good way that we remind our students is always in terms of definitions, the foundations, if you will, of our discussion. And the first definition I want to share with you all today is this one here, the definition of homeland security. Now, this one came out in 2002, and it's what you might expect of that time. Check out that definition. It is a concerted national effort to prevent terrorist attack, to reduce our vulnerability to terrorist attack to minimize the damage and recover from the terrorist attack if that should occur. Terrorism, 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 yes. Okay, good definition in many ways. First of all, I like the fact that it says a concerted national effort, not a governmental effort, effort, and thank God, not just a federal governmental effort, a concerted national effort, right? Good things there. But beyond that, Remember all the things that were brought together in the Department of Homeland Security? Basically 22 separate organizations, drug kicking and screaming into, into one uh, department itself? Well, a lot of the emergency management community read over that definition and said, uh, thanks very much, where's our part in this? And so we got better and smarter over time to where this is how we now describe Homeland Security. And I like this, this is a description, okay? But it is a description that brings the ends, ways, and means that you hear about all the time into our focus. Where homeland security is the intersection of threats and hazards against our people with what? With traditional governmental and civic responsibility in the areas of civil defense, in the areas of emergency response, law enforcement, customs, border control, and immigration. Reminding us again that yes, the government is there, the government should be there, when we cannot provide for ourselves, but there is a civic responsibility involved in this business. And we should never forget that. 
The next definition, one nearer and dearer to the hearts of a lot of the folks in the room here, is this one on homeland defense. This is something that, that the, uh, the, the soldier, sailor, airman, marine can get his, tough, his teeth into. Yeah, this is protection. We're going to protect the sovereignty, the territory, the domestic population, our critical infrastructure. We're going to protect them against what? We're going to protect them against external threats and aggression. And anything else the president, tell, president tells us to do. Got it? Got it. Clear? Clear. But. Okay. This used to be great when, back in the good old days, when all we were worried about was mutual assured destruction between us and the Soviets, looking back and forth at one another. But how do you define external threats nowadays? You know, back when all we were worried about was another major nation state, that was pretty clear. Step over this line, you're a, you are a, uh, a Westphalian product, the same as us, this means war. Okay, got it. All right, so now what if we talk about these, these uh, terrorist type threats organization that we can directly align and assign to a origin out of Iran or an origin out of Yemen or, or, or. Is that an external threat? I mean, they're sponsored by a nation state, but is that an external threat? Well, yeah, probably, I, I suppose. Okay, what about the transnational organizations themselves <laughs> that don't specifically align with any nation state, but they're there, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, that sort of thing. Is that an external threat? Well, yeah, probably. But what about this growing phenomena of the people who are self-selected servants of organizations such as that? People who are being led over the internet to that sort of mindset. People who are reading the guidance from ISIS and responding to it. People who are American citizens and doing all of these things, or people who are American persons, or pardon me, US persons, who legitimately reside within the territorial confines of the United States, but they take this sort of action. Is that an external threat? And that starts to get really, really foggy. Why do we care, right? Well, how are you gonna respond to it? We'll talk a little bit about uh, the di distinctions here in law enforcement and the military here in a second, but it's not as clear as we would like it to be. So let's try to go some, to something a little bit clearer. What we used to refer to as civil support, now we're referring to as defense support of civil authorities. And I like this definition because it's kind of straightforward. What is this? This is support that the United States military gives upon request from duly constituted civil authorities for special events, for domestic emergencies, for designated law enforcement activities, and other domestic activities as required. Okay, what's the big key there for, for you in, in your mind? I'll tell you, from the military's component, it's, it's held right up there in the first clause. It is assistance provided upon request. And ladies and gentlemen, until the, the request comes, we don't move, okay? And that seems a bit odd a particular for a military that prides itself over, over time of preemptive activities, of getting ahead of the battle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not when it comes to these sorts of things. And we'll discuss why here in a little bit as we continue our way through this discussion. Now, no good brief in a, in a military activity is good without a Venn diagram. So let me take this Venn diagram and show you how all that fits together. We have homeland security, we have homeland defense, and we have defense support of civil authorities, all laid out there nicely. And in homeland security, we've talked about that intersection of activities with the threats and hazards. When it comes to homeland defense, we want to address this in terms of first being aware of all of the potential threats, intercepting and defeating those threats once we are aware of them, and then finally providing for mission assurance, what, what we think of as maintaining our capability to do what we need to do when we need to do it, even if we're not doing it at that moment. You will hear uh, in, around these halls people talk about continuity of operations on the military's part on one hand and continuity of government, of the military's provision towards continuity of government on the other hand. Mission assurance is there. And then when we talk about defense support of civil authorities, we're talking about the intersection of DOD support and consequence management as far as disaster relief is concerned, and then moving beyond that to DOD support to designated law enforcement activities. Sounds like a closely guarded term, doesn't it? Okay. Well, there's a reason for that, and I'll give you a foot stomp later on on it, but I don't want to blow my entire brief right here in the first uh, five or ten minutes. 
But just like all good Venn diagrams, you see there's a certain intersection here that we've got to be dealing with. For instance, hijackings over the territorial confines of the United States. Once again, people, not you ma'am in the back there, but people of my ilk, remember when hijackings used to mean it was a guaranteed trip to Cuba, somebody was making a political statement, you were highly, um, let's say, inconvenienced, but that was about the end of it. And that's the way things were until September 11, 2001, at which time hijacking over the air, airspace of the United States took on an entirely different ominous character. And ever since that time, we have been prepared every day to do something to intercept what may be another missile against our people. So that's kind of different. Not the same at all what we were thinking of before. From the other perspective, there's this area here that we talk about. CBRNE, that's one of those military acronyms that drives you absolutely nuts, including me, by the way, because it stands for, get this now, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and E, of course, stands for high explosive yield. I don't know why. I don't make this stuff up. Heck, it's still a marine. It's kind of basic, simple is the way I want to go about things. But the point here is that we bring that additional capability that the military has if and when it is needed. But it is not the primary CBRN response that you would see executed in these endeavors. Why not? Because the civil sector has it to a, degree, a great degree. Hazmat capability is the same thing as chemical, biological, radiological, even to a degree nuclear that we're talking about here. So you start to see the distinctions. Now where that becomes important for some of the guys in the audience uh, who are going on to other military type things is how we divide the distinctions there. Everything to your right, basically, is DOD in support, okay, which is a foreign concept in the way many people look at us because they think when the guy arrives with eight stars reading from left to right across both shoulders, then they must be in charge, right? Well, no. But when 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue drops the D word, then that's when DOD is in the lead. And that's when things change remarkably. Now, I will tell you, we are quite practiced in DOD being in support. But DOD being in the lead means that the rest of the interagency suddenly becomes subservient to the five-sided wind tunnel that you, you and I have grown to know as the Pentagon. Okay. And that is not nearly as well understood. Okay. But there's one other area here that I want you to keep in mind where DOD is deliberately working to enable our partners. This is the quintessential um, manifestation of the old saying about teaching a person to fish as opposed to continuing to give them fish. From the very beginning, DOD started working not only with national but international partners to prepare them to do what they need to do so, oh, by the way, we don't have to do it anymore. I will tell you, the first uh, Secretary of Defense, when all this began in 2001, little Donnie Rumsfeld, looked at the whole Department of Homeland Security and the entire mission as a potential drain to the capabilities that he wanted to retain to fight and win the nation's wars. And this continues to be a, a balance that we've got to maintain all along the way. Okay, so this kind of lays it out, but certainly there's more to the discussion than what we've got here. And the, the next part of, of my discussion with you is, is what I like to use and call the Homeland Security Continuum, another framework, if you will, for your, your thought processes. Basically, we approach Homeland Security and Homeland Defense in this country in a mindset that calls for prevention, protection, response, and recovery. Okay? Now, I will tell you also that over time, we've gotten really good at response and recovery. All right? We have gotten immensely better the re response and reaction to Harvey and Irma and Maria was light years beyond what we saw in Katrina, for instance. And between those things, Sandy. We've gotten a lot better about it. We began this, this business in earnest in the 1990s in what we refer to as a federal response plan that later became the national response plan that later became the national response framework. All important stuff. All essential uh, to, to how we go about doing things, how we organize to go about doing things. But we have not focused nearly as much on this idea of what happens to the left of things. In between protection and response, I want you to insert in your mind's eye the simple word boom, okay? 
This could be a natural activity, this could be a man-made activity, but something has gone very, very badly. Okay? Left of boom, we're pretty good. Right of boom, we're getting better. In the last two administrations, they devoted themselves to the preparation and, and implementation of what we're referring to as a national preparedness guideline. And each one of those things that you see here, prevention, protection, response, and recovery, each one of those things have been made into what the Department of Homeland Security is referred to, referring to as playbooks. These are our approaches to these particular functions, these activities. So we're getting better at the preparedness piece, but I will tell you, we've got some catching up to do as a society, not as a government, okay? Now, either this guy doesn't know how to do PowerPoint slides or there's two more things I need to put on here. What, what are these gaps about, okay? Well, the gaps actually, in our thinking, the military's thinking, uh, were missing but absolutely essential. The first, is, first of those gaps is what I refer to as awareness. And I do it gingerly and a bit cowardly because I don't want to use terms like intelligence because if you talk about intelligence within the territorial confines of the United States, you're going to start getting people upset with you. So we're not gathering intelligence. We have information that we need. There are processes that we have to be prepared for. So being aware of what is coming, either in terms of natural disasters or in terms of potential man-made catastrophes, either accidental or deliberately diabolical in their intent. And then at the far end of the spectrum is what I refer to as analysis. If we have to continue to learn the same lessons over and over again, ladies and gentlemen, that borders on the Einstein's uh, definition of insanity, doing the same things over and over again and expecting the results to be different. Okay? So we've got to analyze the lessons that came out of Katrina and Irma and Harvey and Sandy and, and, and the wildfires that take place all around the United States every year and get better about things. Basically a military approach to another societal function. So the Homeland Security Continuum, I would recommend that to your thinking. And then there's this piece of it, what I refer to as a seam of ambiguity. Now the interesting thing among our people, it's not just our people, but society writ large, is that we have invested authority and responsibility to two separate entities in using kinetic response in support of or even occasionally in protecting our people from ourselves. Okay? Kinetic response. Okay? The one of those, of course, is law enforcement and the other is the military. Okay? We do it wildly different, but basically society says, here's your gun, do what you need to do. A little more to it than that, but you know, I told you at the beginning I was a Marine, I take a simple approach. All right. At the top of this, this diagram, therefore, you see the types of threats that my people, our people are facing. At the bottom of the diagram, you see the responsibility to address those threats across the federal government. Basically, when you're talking about law enforcement, you have those, as far as, as the federal government is concerned, basically divided between the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security nowadays. Hard for the Department of Justice to take this on, but there are probably more law enforcement officials in the Department of Homeland Security than the Department of Justice. But that's just a fun fact and of no, no greater use than that. But when it comes down to the matter of defense, then it belongs to the Department of Defense. Pretty plain and simple. Why is that important? Because nobody else is going to be picking up their responsibilities if things go south. That's why we are perhaps a little more guarded in our expenditure of resources than a lot of people would think about. Okay, so how does this manifest itself on application? Well, at the far end of things, well, there's war, and the military responds to that. And at the other end of things, well, there's crime, and those types of activities. But in between those things, we have an area of vulnerability, I think, and what I refer to as the seam of ambiguity, with things that are not clearly solely either military or law enforcement in the functions required to respond to those things. Now, what sorts of things are we talking about here? Well, border security is one of them. That's, that's one thing. And I will tell you that maritime security is another one. And probably the best example that we have in these United States of coming together to deal with those issues is a thing called the Motor Initiative, Maritime Operational Threat Response, where the United States Navy and the United States Coast Guard have gotten together and said, okay, as we see the threats coming to the United States, we have got to make a determination of what type of threat this is and how we are going to respond to it. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it is a wonder to behold, and it is a 
fine example of how governmental agencies ought to work together. It's a great thing. The cooperation there is remarkable. The United States Navy, like the United States Army, like the United States Marine Corps, like the United States Air Force, cannot perform law enforcement functions. But there's nothing to stop a United States destroyer from having a law enforcement detachment from the United States Coast Guard aboard their vessel and doing what needs to be done to prevent a problem from becoming a, a uh, moving from a crime to a national security issue. So it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, framework, if you will, or template, if you will, for us to, f to follow. Another, the other area of concern I would recommend to you is this one, cybersecurity. Now you know when a concern is divided between three major federal agencies, then we've got that baby right under control. No question about it. The department, who's, got, who's responsible for cybersecurity? Well, the Department of Defense on the one hand, Department of Homeland Security on the other hand, Department of Justice there in the middle. This is an evolving issue, folks. But this is the sort of thing that we're going to have to be dealing with. And the reason I'm so, so concerned about the seam of ambiguity is because our adversaries are already demonstrating a proclivity for addressing and exploring those seams. And sometimes our own mechanisms, our own ideals can be used against us. And this is something that we're going to have to deal with over time. And then there's this one. How do we approach homeland security in these United States? Well, it's a question of balance. Now, do I have any people from uh, governmental institutions outside of the federal government here? Okay, wonderful. Sir, you are from? Arkansas. Okay, Arkansas. And what do you do? Okay, wonderful, okay, good stuff. Then you will appreciate this, I hope. We want to take care of our people. And you see the range of threats that we, we may face with our people. And these are just examples, of course. And as they move over to the right of the slide there, then it becomes clearer and clearer that this might be a national issue. But I will tell you that the governors are reticent about the national implications and about the, the national um, insertion right away. And particularly for my active component friends, we're saying, all right, look, what's the problem here? If you need help and you want our help, ask for the help. And when help arrives, get out of the way and let us give the help, right? But the problem with that is this. You remember the, the continuum I talked about, res uh, prevention, protection, response, and recovery? OK, we are now to the right of boom. Something has happened. We're doing something about that. Response, when it actually comes to response, the federal component is, as my friend from Arkansas will tell you, relatively short-lived. They want to come in there, they want to get the duly constituted authorities back on their feet, especially the military wants to get them back on their feet, and then we want to steal away into the night. Get back to what we were doing when we were doing things before we went to response. That's not a matter of abrogation either, by the way, folks. And I'll get back to that in a second. Now. If I'm the governor of Arkansas, or Mississippi, or North Dakota, or, 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 and I have the idea that the only time my people are going to see us evolving or emerging from a crisis is when the green-clad monsters that you and I have grown to know and love come in and save the day and pull our fat out of the fire, then what does that do in terms of trust and confidence of my constituency once you guys leave? Okay? And leadership is important. Now I've jumped all over, uh, I'll, I'll jump way across the divide that talks about the work that is being done in the state that would continue to be done but they have either exceeded their capability or the capacities within those capabilities. Okay, I've jumped completely by that. But the simple fact of the matter is there's a leadership issue that has to be addressed. And when you go away federal government, I'm going to have the rest of response and all of recovery to take care of. So the issues are important. And the President of the, United, of the United States might jump up in the Oval Office, pound his chest, and say, look, according to Article 2 of the Const United States Constitution, I am granted these authorities. I am given these responsibilities. I am responsible for my citizens. And the governors, all 54 of them, will jump up and say, I'll see your Article 2 and raise you a Tenth Amendment that says, unless I call you, you don't come unless it is specifically assigned to you by the Constitution of the United States, it resides with the people, and I am the leader of the people. So sit down, Donald. Okay? 
that's the sort of thing, that's a precarious balance that we always have to maintain. Democracy is not easy, okay? But we have to keep those things in mind, and we shall. Now, it's all very good for the state to say, we got it, no problem. But we also want to frame the issue in reality. Now, I had a great friend of mine, anyone here from the state of Washington or, or close by there? Okay, National Guardsman, you, you know, you know, the, the, the wonderful guy who used to be the Adjutant General of the state of Washington, we just lost him uh, last year, Tim Lowenberg. This guy was the Adjutant General of the state of Washington's National Guard for 12 years. And he was the go-to guy among the Adjutant General of the United States for Homeland Security issues. You would see them in forums, Homeland Security would come up in discussion, and everybody just kind of quietly looked towards Tim. What's, what's Tim doing here? Now, Tim had this, this, this thing that, he, that I refer to as the division of disaster. And it goes basically like, like this. Now, folks, this is not literal, because he did come back to me and say, what are you doing to me? This was a figurative thing, and people have come back to him and say, wait, according to Professor Tossing, 94, no, okay, listen, figurative, all right? But Tim used to say, 94% of the time, all emergencies can be handled at this local level, at the local level, all right? That's why we have police departments. That's why we have fire departments. That's why we have emergency medical technicians, et cetera, et cetera. That's why they're there, okay? 4% of the time, the capacity of the local government to include their calling out to adjoining jurisdictions may be so overstretched that they have to call in the additional capabilities of the states. And my, as my friend from Arkansas will tell you, there's not that much more there. But if they need it, they can call upon it. Okay, math for Marines, 94 and four. That leaves what? That leaves maybe 2% of the time you really need a significant insertion of the federal component. Only 2% of the time. But here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, when the 2% arrives, they want it yesterday. Okay, that means things have gotten tucks on bad, right? We need additional, not necessarily capabilities, but capacities than we have here to handle the situation at hand. And when that time comes, we need them, all right? And you, Pentagon, should be prepared to send them. Thank you. All right. So that's one of the ways that we think about things. But here's something else I want to leave in your mind right now. No, no, I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to save it for a second because I, as I build this, this discussion. But another thing, uh, a, f a friend of mine that used to be a fine Air Force officer and now has become a stinking, low-lying, uh, scum-sucking, bottom-dwelling contractor named Chip Cummins. And Chip Cummins also had a, a way of looking at things that I refer to over time as the transitive law of disaster. And it goes basically like this. Ready? Step one. All disasters are local. Okay? Doesn't matter. It all begins in a locality. And depending upon the size of the, of the activity, it may require more to take care of it than a locality can bear. But it's all local. And as the late, great Tip O'Neill, former Speaker of the House of Representatives, was famous for saying, all politics are local, right? Therefore, yes, all disasters are political. They are. There is a component. Okay, now political is not necessarily a bad word. Okay, and by the way, Tussing's corollary to this is all politics is disastrous, but that's not the point I'm <laughs> talking about with you either. The point here is that there is a political element that we have got to keep in our minds, that, and with a small p, all right? How is this being read by our people? How do they see things? How are we portraying things? What message are the people receiving with regard to the response that has been done so far? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an area that I think we have to become more and more concerned about. Because if we ever really hit a catastrophic event, that is not the time to start pointing fingers about who did or did not do what needed to be done. It will be catastrophic. And we're going to be needing to pull together as a people. Next conceptual idea I have for you is this one. DOD's philosophy, if you will, and I, I will warn you, I've had people swinging from the rafters, uniform people saying, DOD doesn't do philosophy. Okay, Tussing does philosophy. But this is DOD's philosophy on disaster response, all right? And here's the first thing. I've alluded to it several times, but here it is again. Ready? The military is in support of the civil authorities. Let me emphasize that. The military is in support of the civil authorities. Now that is counterintuitive to 99% of the population that sees the uniform elements arriving and saying, hey Bubba, you're in charge. 
I don't want to be in charge. Okay? In his heart of heart, when the, inter- when the general arrives in the, on scene, he wants to plug into whatever response you have going on. Ideally, he or she would like to plug into whatever response you two have designed together, or types of response that we have designed together, to immediately or as quickly as possible ameliorate the situation and take care of our people. But we don't want to be in charge. Okay? Here's the second thing. Civil resources and capabilities and manpower should be used first. All right? Now that sounds like we are taking a very niggardly approach to this. We're, we're being selfish with our resources. No, 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 no. No, not at all. Because if, as I've tried to allude several times, there may come a time when it will become very, very important to prioritize what we send into areas. It may become very, very important because we have moved, we have transitioned to the next tier of destruction that we, we, we uh, are calling catastrophic beyond disaster. So we need to be thinking about those things. And oh, by the way, we also have to be mindful of the time that may come when the Department of Defense is in heavily engaged in the business of defending. These are things that we've got to be thinking about. All right? Here's the third thing. Love this one. This came from, straight from General Powell. Missions have got to be limited in scope and duration. Powell would come to in a situation, he says, okay, what's our exit strategy? What's our exit criteria? At what point have we achieved the ends? By the way, have you told me what the ends are so that I can start handing this back over to the civil authorities and leave and get ready to do the next thing that needs to be done? We're not real good at that from time to time, folks. Not just in terms of domestic activity, by the way, overseas activities as well, but exit criteria, scope, duration. Here's another one. This might not be as intuitive to a lot of folks because, uh, let's face it, most of you, you can see a National Guardsman from Indiana and a troop from the 82nd Airborne Division, and they don't look really all that different, all right? But disaster response for the military is a total force effort, active duty and reserve component. And the reserve component can be divided between the service reserves and, of course, our National Guards. And they've got to be working together. And I will tell you that the most, and this this drives some people nuts, but the most important day-to-day function is without question performed by the National Guard because they know the civil authorities are supporting. Ideally, they have worked with them. They have planned with them. And when the active component does come to town, they look towards the uh, the National Guard as being a conduit for insertion of the capabilities or the additional capacities that they bring. So it's a little different. And it's a little counterintuitive to a lot of folks, but that's the way it is. That's why we're here to talk about it. And then finally, and this one really gets some people, we expect to be paid back. Oh my gracious, this should be reimbursable. Here's something that no one thinks about. You shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be charged with thinking about it. Everything that the active component of the United States military does in disaster response is taken out of hide. We do not budget for emergency response in the United States military, an active component. We don't. There are other things that that $700 billion is being extended towards, all right? So, the Department of Defense, the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and Global Security in particular, that is the main, if you will, overarching uh, overseer of these issues within the military, want us to be a little more guarded about how fast we grab the checkbook and start writing out these checks. And when the time comes, we expect to be paid back. Now, you see two things up there, the Economy Act and the Stafford Act. It's no big deal there. The Economy Act basically indicates to other federal interagency partners, okay, if the Department of Transportation asks for help from the military, they're going to pay the military back. The Stafford Act basically says if the states ask for help from the federal government, they're going to pay the federal government back. And I will tell you that this is a pretty good deal for the states. Basically, they're looking for about a 25% restoration of of the funds that have been expended. And then, of course, the governors will all, will all try to duck the 25% as well as they can because that's the American way, right? But this is something else we've got to keep in mind on how we approach these issues. And then there's what I, re- what I think of as mission acceptance criteria. Okay, if we're given missions, if we're given um, requests by those civil authorities, there are certain m- measuring sticks that we've got to pull out at all times before we really want to jump into this situation. And there's reasons for all of it. 
The first one is just simply the question of legality. Can we do this according to the laws of the United States? And that's not as automatic as a lot of people might think. And then there's the question of lethality. What's the threat that our forces may be facing? What's the threat that our forces may be bringing to the situation? Okay? And how do we husband those and contain those threats? And close akin to that is the idea of risk to those forces. Right? And then following that immediately is the idea of cost. And we've already talked about why. And then there's this, this business here, the idea of readiness. Remember, especially the present uh, Secretary of Defense is, is enjoining us daily to be prepared to go, not tomorrow, tonight. And let's face it, the world environment is one where we may be called upon to do that sort of thing. And believe me, ladies and gentlemen, when I talk about this, this, this reservation and this reticence, it is, not a, it is not a matter of not wanting to be there for the American people when the time comes, when the, when the call comes. We want to be there like 10 men. But if things hit the fan, you're not going to call upon the Department of Commerce to fill in for the United States Marine Corps, for instance. So that's why we take this with a measured response, and we're so careful about it. And then there's a simple question of appropriateness. In our heart of hearts, is this the right thing? Is this in the interest of the Department of Defense to do this? Or in the interest of the government of the United States to do this? Or in the interest of the people of the United States to do this? Do we want to set this into the mindset of Mr. and Mrs. Public as the traditional and recurring mechanism to taking care of these problems? I would suggest you probably not. OK. Let's go on with some other thoughts about here. When we talk about defense support of civil authorities, and I want to go through this relatively quickly, we talk about three major categories, if you will. We talk about domestic emergencies, we talk about those designated law enforcement activities, and then we talk about what we, what we clinically refer to as other activities. Okay, so when we go from categories and we go down to types, that one's, that's when things start to get interesting for us. Because that first type is what you expect, you know, disasters or declared emergencies. And then the third type, you know, when we talk about national special security events, that's something that we're all kind of used to. And then we can talk about pre-planned support for other types of activities, and that's something else we're, we're also used to. But when you talk about that category that I, that I skipped very deliberately, when you talk about things that the military is doing to support or restore public health, that's good, or civil order, and that's where you can hear the teeth-sucking sound coming from all over the Pentagon, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know. And why? Why do we want to make this distinction? If we're talking about civil authorities, we're talking about law enforcement, why do we want to make that distinction? Well, for those of you who've got any kind of historical background in these issues, you know a little bit about the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878. Basically what it was was the good people of the South and the Reconstruction South saying, wait a minute, why are all these military people here to enforce laws? If you say that we are now a house reunited, and we are all citizens of the United States. Why are these people doing what they're doing? So we said, Jay Verley, you know what? You're right, you rebels. You're absolutely right. And so since that time, we've said the United States active component, beginning with the Army, but also the Navy, and the Marine Corps, and the Air Force by extension, may not do this sort of law enforcement activities. So you're saying, OK, so what's the big deal? You've been telling me about the National Guard. It's just the active component can't, that can't do these sorts of things, right? And I said, well, yeah, you know, basically, that's absolutely right. But I'll tell you what, I have yet to meet the state adjutant general who's saying, yeah, baby, give me some of that. Let me go in and do police work. And why? Why are they so reticent about it? Well, my friends from the Guard know why. Because we're soldiers. We're not policemen. And we want that distinction. And I will tell you that the, the mindset behind a soldier and a policeman are markedly different. I will tell you 500 years ago when I was in the United States Marine Corps and doing something for society as opposed to talking to people a lot, if I had a Marine that didn't immediately lift his weapon with the idea of firing down range, I'd rip his lips off. Because the idea from the beginning is that person is trying to kill you or kill the person next to you. There is no decision, there is no hesitation, fire or you will be fired upon. The law enforcement officer does not have that luxury. From the time he or she starts to unholster their weapon, they're going through a series 
of decisions about what the intention is of that individual downrange. Does the, the, the individual really have a weapon? Is that a real weapon? Oh my gracious. So immediately, automatically saying, okay, you're in a uniform and you're in a uniform, what's the problem here? You can do this business is ludicrous. And it is not what our society expects of our military. And they would turn on us and they would be right. So what else about this? So how do we approach this business of a, a deliberately designed mission within Defense Support of Civil Authorities that we refer to as Defense Support of Civilian Law Enforcement Agency? Well, first of all, we start largely with the words, we cannot. We cannot do direct or active support of those law enforcement agencies. We are prohibited from doing that. And we may not execute actions against our own citizenry that can be either interpreted as directive or What's the other word they, they have up there? Um, yeah, well, doesn't really matter. Yes, it does. Directive or control, or even worse, the idea of coercion. Not our job, not what we want to do, not what the American people want us to do. Now, that sounds pretty good, but sometimes interpretation would surprise you. So, for instance, we're talking about activities like interdiction, the United States military active duty component, cannot do that. Now, why do I say it like that? Because the National Guard can, by the authority of the governor. Because most often the National Guard is, their commander in chief is that governor. But when we talk about the active component, no, no, no. When we talk about arrest, no, no, no. Stopping and frisking, uh-uh. Search and seizure, no. Interrogation, absolutely not. Gathering evidence, oh no. Surveillance, no. Because the American people expect that this military, who in the history of the world, if, if, if military ever represented the thought of being, with no apologies to Lincoln, of the people, by the people, and therefore definitively for the people, is the voluntary force that exists in the United States today, without question. And happily, no one feels stronger about that than the military itself and our leadership. That's why there's such reticence. Okay. So when we look at this, though, another practical example, if you will, is let, let's take up the question of border security. Now, I want you to imagine this as a grid. Now, by the way, you're looking at an English literature major from the Citadel 500 years ago, so I don't do math, all right? But this is kind of imaginary, and we have a grid, and we have an ascension of threats along that grid. Now, at the bottom of the grid, as far as the uh, uh, border is concerned, we have basically what we refer to as border control. Basically, trying to just prevent the illegal entry of people or things. Not necessarily malevolent, malevolent people or things. Okay? We're just trying to protect the society occasionally against unanticipated things, unmalicious, once again. Okay? This is where the majority of our focus is. The majority of our concern along the border still remains the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Most of the people in, who come across the borders illegally, all they're looking for is opportunities, and we feel for them. And therefore, we provide a legal mechanism for them to enter to the country. And we may change things from time to time, but this is now the law. And Customs and Border Protection can basically take care of this by themselves. But as we move up that threat axis that I've imagined here, we have concerns about border safety, protecting our citizens against violence and criminal elements. Criminal elements at one end of the spectrum ranging as the cartel and the other end of the spectrum ranging as the gangs, which are becoming the foot soldiers for the cartels in many areas of the country today. And that requires a little more, if you will, of a kinetic response than we thought of in border control. And that's when federal, state, and local law enforcement have got, have got to come, come together. But then I want you to imagine the upper end of the spectrum, if you will, where uh, General Barry McCaffrey, who later became the, the, the drug control czar of the United States after he retired from the United States uh, Army, called this nexus between transnational organized crime and transnational terrorism, and the threat that that brings to our people. And at that point, we have to be concerned not about it in terms of an unmalevolent event, or even a criminal element that doesn't want to bring the country to its knees, that's killing the parasitic host but a, a, a group of people who intend to bring the country down. Happily, we haven't engaged in that sort of thing now, but is it really that hard for you and I to imagine? And I would suggest to you, no, it's not. 
Okay, I want to move away from law enforcement here really quickly and, and get into the other area of our concern, and that's getting back to natural disasters. Now, we have, we have to take a clinical approach in, in defining what we mean by these sorts of things from time to time. When we talk about catastrophes, we're talking about something, as I described a moment ago, above the next tier of destruction beyond the types of natural disasters that we've seen. People talk about Katrina having been a catastrophe. People talk about Sandy having been a catastrophe. I would suggest to you that if you're talking to someone who went through it, don't tell them that it wasn't a catastrophe because that will make them angry. But when we use words like this, we use it for a very specific reason. It signals different types of activities. It signals different types of expenditures, if you will. The Department of Defense came up a few years ago with what we refer to as a complex catastrophe. And you can see the definition there. It's an interesting one. It talks about incidents, either natural or man-made, that can lead to a set of events that will result in a cascading failure of multiple interdependent critical life-sustaining infrastructure. And you see what happens after that, causing extraordinary amounts of loss of, of mass, mass casualties, damage, destruction, disruption against the population, against the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see it there. It's an interesting definition, but what really most do more than anything else, folks, is we have grown in the immensity, the enormity, and the endurance of the event. This is not something that we will recover from quickly. Now let's compare that for just a second. When we talked about Katrina, Hurricane Katrina was, at that time, you, you will recall perhaps some of you, as that was the hurricane of the century. And then several years later, we had the next hurricane of the century and that sort of thing. But it was massive, no question about it. It struck three states' coastal areas, and it resulted in a great deal of destruction. It, it resulted in 17,000 injuries. It resulted in 1,800 deaths. It resulted in us having to close 30 hospitals in the area. A concern? You betcha. An impact? You betcha. Now let's imagine, if you will, a genuinely catastrophic event. People from the Midwest? Anyone? Okay, sir. You know. We've been waiting for the New Madrid Fault to go. And in 2011, we had a national level exercise where we examined what would happen if the New Madrid Fault went. The last time the New Madrid Fault had a, not an earthquake, a series of earthquakes, was in the early 1800s. Geography, remember Mississippi? It rang church bells in Boston. It reversed the flow of the Mississippi River. And at the time, there weren't certain pieces of infrastructure along that river like St. Louis, Memphis, things like that. Can you imagine? What we're talking about here in terms of uh, uh, quantitative scope, eight states spread across four different FEMA regions would be impacted by this. And estimations at the time was it would immediately, immediately note, please, immediately result in 83,000 injuries, 3,500 deaths, and the destruction or debilitation of 132 hospitals in that region. Immediately. Now, why do I continue to emphasize that? Because the secondary and tertiary effects of what we're talking about here would result in a death toll far exceeding what we've talked about already. If you measure where to go down, in terms of qualitative impact, let's examine this for just a second. And you imagine it's not the only type of thing that we can think about in these regards. But one of the things that we would be looking at, well, let's, let's review what happened in Katrina. As bad as Katrina was, and this is a conservative figure here, by the way, as bad as Katrina was, within two weeks' time, we had 85% of the power grid restored along those coastal regions that were stricken. I will tell you, I've read 95% in other, in other um, sources. Given the scenario that we looked at with the uh, New Madrid Fault, it would take upwards of 18 months to restore the power grid there. And that would result in that, that remember what I was talking about, interdependent multiple critical life, uh, pardon me, critical infrastructure, life-sustaining infrastructure, transportation, if you will, municipal water, if you will. Think about that region of the country. Gravity doesn't help much in water flow. Okay? Hospitals, and this is the one that gets me too, law enforcement. Ladies and gentlemen, our law enforcement is, is, is designed for a society which basically wants to follow the laws. 
It is not designed for a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week assault against law. Okay. But if there's one thing we know about catastrophe from the history of mankind, is it brings out the very, very best and the very worst in our people. I've talked to law enforcement uh, officials. I've had them here for exercises. And their eyes just got wide. And after a few days into the exercise, we'll ask them, how long do you think you could sustain your operations? And they go, a matter of days. So why am, I, why am I telling you this? Because this is one of the challenges that I think we have to start preparing for now. There are other challenges. The one challenge I would suggest to you, one of the foremost challenges, is these great United States. We are a very federal people. And we are almost jealously guarded in how we're going to respond to things. By golly, because that's the way we do it in Missouri, or in Texas, or, 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 or. And we've got to start thinking about how we're going to come together to support one another when the requirements come. Another area that we have to be concerned about, I already alluded to, the partnership between, between the private sector, other organizations, and the government in protecting our critical infrastructure. Not against people who are trying to sneak into the fence line, but people who want to bring down that infrastructure, that sort of thing. The other one is border security. We've already alluded to that. But this is the one I really want you to think about, to go away with here today. No one. No one in the United States, least of all the United States military, wants to see the United States Army applied in the law enforcement function among our own people. But if we find ourselves awakening to a day where the law enforcement entities of these United States are overwhelmed, not due to anything that they have or have not done, but they simply cannot meet the call when the call comes, then what? And I ask you to think about that yourselves because now is the time to start asking then what, and how do we prepare for it? Because I would suggest to you it'll be a lot easier to make the transition to the American people to the requirement if we've established some sort of mindset with the people who are going to be implementing the transition. And then finally, and perhaps most important in this discussion, the challenge we're facing is both the existent and what is likely to be the remaining attitude of our people about who's responsible for their well-being. Expectations of the government, I was suggesting nowadays, have been completely overblown. And it's time for us to remember that we have a stake in this, that I am my brother's keeper, and that if the really, really bad things come, I've got to be prepared to be a part of the solution.